Well, welcome to the Middlesex Moments radio show. I'm Dr. Anna Wasesha, president of Middlesex Community College, located right here in Middletown, Connecticut. And today my guest is Secretary of State, Denise Merrill, and she has come to our campus today to promote voter registration. I think today is, is the voter registration day, although the fact is you can register almost any day and almost online as well as in person. That's right. Uh, and uh, we're going to be uh, taped here uh, in, in a space at the college where there are uh, about 60 students. We're delighted to have them here. They're going to ask some questions that they will um, write down on cards. I'll ask them of uh, the secretary. And we're looking forward to a really great show and hope that um, afterwards all of you will not only register and vote in the upcoming election, but tell your friends and relatives how important it is too. So with that, welcome, Secretary Merrill. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here and happy National Voter Registration Day, <laughs> which is what we're here uh, promoting and making sure everyone knows not only how important it is to vote, but how easy it is to register to vote and how important it is that you at least register to vote. Now I'll start by saying my job as Secretary of the State is to sort of oversee elections in the state of Connecticut, but I do other jobs as well, so it's part of my job. I also register uh, businesses, all the businesses in the state come through my office. I produce the Connecticut Blue Book, which is a book of all information about Connecticut, very historic, it's been published for hundreds of years, and we keep a lot of records for the state. But the elections part is what we're most known for, I think. And when I say we oversee elections, it means we also you know, let people know about elections. We're kind of like the cheerleaders for elections, if you will. Um, and I find that to be a terribly important part of my job because many people now, uh, I don't think it's any secret, many people today feel pretty disconnected from their government. And there are a lot of very powerful reasons for that. Um, I have to tell you that when I grew up, uh, you never would have said, for example, you know, I don't think I'll get around to voting today. That would have been a socially unacceptable point of view because it was viewed, and still should be, I believe, that one of your duties as a citizen is to vote. That's because people have fought and died for the right to vote for hundreds of years, and there's been a steady march of progress toward voting rights. And different groups have understood why it was so important over the years. Just this year, of course, we're celebrating the 50th anniversary of the Voting Rights Act, arguably, I believe, one of the most important pieces of civil rights action this country has ever seen. And what it did is it made real the promise of the right to vote for African American citizens in this country really for the first time, and that was just in 1965, my lifetime. I remember it. So these rights are fairly new for many groups, and they understood because they stood up, and in this case on the bridge in Selma, and they stood up for that right to vote, and they understood that it was the most important thing they could get because without that right to vote, you have no voice. Other people are making decisions for you and you have no way to influence those decisions. Now sadly, I think we've gotten a little complacent about all that in this country because the voting rates are really fairly low. For a developed country, we're one of the worst in the world. Um, we believe that throughout nationally, about a third of the eligible voters, that is, what are the two things you need to be a voter? You need to be 18 years old, and by the way, in my lifetime, we won that right to vote for 18 years old. I remember it. It used to be 21 until they sent a bunch of my friends to Vietnam to fight. And we started saying, wait a minute, you can go fight, but you can't vote. That seemed wrong. We won that fight. So now 18 years old and a citizen of the country. With those two qualifications, you can vote. And that's an amazing fact. But like I say, it was a long fought uh, war, really, in many cases, to get the right to vote. Women uh, got the right to vote in 1920, the year my mother was born, and it took them over 70 years to win the right to vote. That was really a hard-fought war. And so I think we should all take it very, very seriously when we realize that a third of the voters in this country, the eligible voters, aren't even registered to vote. So when you see those turnout numbers, like for example, the highest turnout numbers we get is in a presidential year. 
and we're maybe in Connecticut, maybe 75% of the registered voters are voting. But that doesn't even count the people who have checked out before they even got to register. And that means that number is really much lower. And that's a scandal. Now, I realize more than most people why that's true. And I hear it from people every day. My vote doesn't matter. Nobody's going to listen to me. It's not going to matter my one vote. I won't, I won't just tell you about the mathematics of that, because mathematically, I can tell you firsthand a whole bunch of elections that were won or lost by one or two votes right here in the state. In fact, this was originally part of the second congressional district where someone won once by like 10 votes. Um, and that was someone to represent you in Congress. But uh, beyond the mathematics, um, I understand why people feel very tuned out and cynical about politics. I was telling you earlier about a radio show I was on this morning where we were talking about how people are so cynical because it's so vicious. Sometimes you, you watch these things on television, people are calling each other names. I wish I could tell you this was new. Frankly, back in the early Republic, we had people stab each other. <laughs> they used to have, you know, like sword fights on the, on the floor of the Congress. So it's really not new that people get very heated about politics. But I think it is, um, it's not a good thing. It, it really um, embarrasses us, I think, to have such a low level of civic discourse. What we really need are people to come together to try to solve problems. And I do believe that most of us that have been in public life a long time uh, really are here because we want to solve problems. We're not doing this to get rich, trust me. You don't get paid that much money. I was a uh, state representative for 17 years, and I think I got paid $28,000 a year to do that job. So it's not like you do it for the money. I think most people who are in politics truly want to do something for their communities and for their state. It's harder to get up higher levels. But you know, this year is the local election. This is where you vote for people right in your hometown. And Connecticut, at least, is still kind of a, a state of small towns. You still can know the people like right in your town. They've usually lived there a long time, and even if they haven't, they're stepping up to do jobs that are helping people. And I want to particularly encourage you to think about running for office, not just voting. You know, I never thought I'd run for office, and if I can do it, you can do it. If you have opinions and you have ways that you, you know that you can articulate your points of view and you care about things and you want you know whatever it is, you can make a difference. And I think everyone should start thinking about that because that's one of the great things about this country. Anybody can step up and run for office. So let's hope that one of you will do that, or two, or three, or four, or five. Absolutely. And so on that note, we're going to take a break, and we'll be right back after this. Well, we're back, and it's the Middlesex Moments radio show, and it's a special show because we have Secretary of State Denise Merrill here, and we've been talking. She's been talking about why she got involved in politics and why voting is so important and some of the elements of, of the situation we find ourselves in in our living and breathing democracy. So questions have come in from the audience, and I'm, I, haven't, uh, I have no intention of ordering them in any particular order, so I'm going to start with the first one. And the first question is, if one voted last year, do you have to sign up again to vote? Oh, absolutely not. It's a lifetime thing, you know, so you sign up today, you're in. <laughs> if you move, you need to tell somebody. And that's something that I don't think we've quite caught up with the times, but our databases are not national. And that's a real problem we're working to solve. Uh, eventually, there will be a national database. Right now, it's statewide. So once you register to vote, you can vote in any election. And then if you move, you need to go down to town hall. Or you know, I haven't talked about this yet, but there's an online system. You can go online. If you have a Connecticut driver's license or one of those, if you don't drive one of those cards, uh, Connecticut ID, you can register to vote online or you can change your address online. And by the way, if you change your address on your driver's license, it doesn't automatically change your voter registration card, so you've got to re-register in the new address. So here's another one. Can an immigrant who has lived here but is in the process of getting their green card vote? No. You must be a citizen. And this is a very important point because you don't want to get in trouble on this one. And um, you need to become a citizen. 
it's come to my attention, I go, go to a lot of these citizenship ceremonies, that a lot of people are eligible for citizenship but don't go get it anymore, which came as a real shock to me because I think of it as such a precious thing. So yes, you, you must be a citizen. The two very strict requirements, 18 years old by the time of the election. By the way, if you're 17 and a half and you will be 18 by November 3rd this year, you can still register to vote in that election. Okay, uh, th these are getting more and more intense as they come up from the audience. Here's a, here's a, 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 a probing question. Is there corruption in our voting process? And if not, how does the system go centuries corruption free? Well, I mean, no, I honestly think our system is quite clean. People mean a lot of different things when they say corruption. I think we have a good system of identifying people. I mean, this has been a big topic over the last three or four years in the United States. Connecticut has a very good system of identifying people when they come to the polls. First of all, you have to show a lot of ID just to register. You have to give you know, your name, address, social security number, last four digits. So you identify yourself once then. Then when you come to vote, you need to be on the list and that list, then you must have some form of identification to show you are the person on the list. So we're pretty good in Connecticut with all that. If you mean by corruption, are people voting twice? Do we have lots of illegal aliens voting that shouldn't be? We have a, an enforcement system. There's an election enforcement commission. I don't do that, I just oversee. And if there, the, any citizen can complain to the election enforcement commission, I have to say when the topic of illegal aliens voting first came up when I first came in office about five years ago. Um, I looked into it. We have had one complaint of that sort in the last 20 years. My private belief is we have very little of that because illegal aliens mostly don't want to get caught. And so <laughs> it seems to me counterintuitive that there would be a rush of people who weren't qualified trying to vote illegally. I think, indeed, as we said before, it's the opposite problem. The real problem is that not enough people are voting. Um, and so I would say in Connecticut we have uh, some problems. Most of, mostly they revolve around things like not getting the list to the polls in time, but it's very strictly regulated. We have tons of law. Um, everything is regulated. Just, even today we had a, a statewide issue about who could be on the ballot. and. Uh, missing a deadline. You miss a, any kind of deadline, you're out. And so it's, uh, I think we have a pretty good system in this country. Now there's a lot of questions about online voting. Are we ever going to be able to do online voting? I think that would have the potential for corruption. I really do. And I am not for online voting at this point because I think it could be hacked. And every time something like Target gets hacked, everybody says, whoa, maybe we better not do the online voting thing because we have no tolerance for, you know, any kind of slippage, shall we say, in the system. We can't just say, oh, well, 5% of the votes probably are wrong. No, we want to be very, very accurate. So this is, uh, I'm listening to you, and then I'm looking at the questions, and I, uh, I'm fascinated by all of this. So I will say there was a little bit of a trend in the questions about the impact of social media. Mm -hmm. So, and really, the social media and hacking, it's really the internet world that we live in, right? So, um, so what do you think the impact of social media is, and could it be uh, increased, and will it actually influence the outcomes of elections? Um, oh, I think social media is making a huge difference in the communication system and the way, um, I think President Obama was the first one that had an amazing operation in terms of social media outreach and, and even fundraising. Uh, they did a lot through the internet. It's an amazingly powerful tool and politics has certainly discovered it. Uh, in terms of the actual voting process, we're trying to bring in more electronic, uh, you know, for example, I think we're way behind the time in the way we do the actual voting because you still have to go get your name crossed off in paper and pencil. There's lots of mistakes that are made, but we're bringing in what they call electronic poll books, which will not be internet voting or any of that, but it'll be a way to check you in electronically, which of course makes sense because then you're checked off and you don't have to do a lot of writing and crossing off things and adding things up later. So there's a lot more we can do to make things more efficient in voting, but I think the impact of social media is mostly going to be on the sort of consumer end, if you will. And so um, in the last presidential election, social media changed the voter turnout 
as well, right? So yes. larger groups of younger people, That's larger right. groups of African Americans. So That's really, right. Yeah, yeah, yes, right. It is having an impact on who's showing up. And the way, that's one of the reasons we felt so strongly about doing an online voter registration system, because who's using it? We've had, I don't know, some 40 or 50,000 people have signed up. Well, over half of them are the 18 to 20 year olds. So they're the, you know, you guys are the ones that do, do everything online, and that's where it's headed. So we're gonna take a break, and when we come back, we've got another um, section of the program and more questions to ask the secretary. Well, we're back to the Middlesex Moments Radio Show. I'm Dr. Anna Wasesha, president of Middlesex Community College. Today, we're visiting with uh, Secretary of State Denise Merrill, and we're in front of an audience, a very quiet audience, but they haven't been quiet with a pens and paper because they're asking questions and sending them up to me of about 60 Middlesex Community College students, all of whom we hope are gonna be very involved in the, in the public life of our democracy, and that it certainly includes voting and learning about the issues. So it's not, it's not just voting. Although voting is really important, but you got to know what you're voting for and who you're voting for. Uh, so here's one of the questions from the audience, which are, what are some of the local elections in Connecticut this year, and what cities will be holding elections? So I guess every city isn't holding an election, is that right? Well, pretty much every town holds an election. Some of them are more contested than others. So there's an election, I can't think of a town where there's not an election going on. Um, there's a handful that still have their elections in May because we're still, a ta you know, we have no counties in Connecticut. So there's 169, sometimes very tiny towns, and they all have to have town governments. And actually what's happening is that it's more and more difficult to find people who will, do they're donating their time in many cases to sit on local boards and commissions. And so frequently there's no contest. The towns where there are, con our cities where there's contests are, for example, Hartford, is having a big mayoral race. Uh, Bridgeport is, is having a big mayoral race. Uh, New Haven less so because there's not a mayor in the ballot, but there's several contested uh, races in New Haven where the Yale students get quite involved actually in local elections in New Haven. So they tend to have a bigger turnout in the local elections. Um, you know, but in places like in a lot of the small towns, there's very little information out there. You know, it's just, people who are very involved in the life of the town tend to run the town, and which is great, uh, but I think it would be much better if everyone participated, and that's kind of how it used to be. In New England, we have the proud tradition of the town meeting, where everyone in the town used to go and fight out whatever their issues were in the town, you know, for example, how much tax they were paying, or, uh, you know, whatever the issues were. Uh, that town meeting is still alive in many towns. They still have town meetings, and I think that's why it's kind of special to live in Connecticut, because we still have a very participatory uh, uh, democracy out there. So uh, let me ask you this question, and then we're going to switch, because I wish we had an infinite amount of time. But you probably do too, right? There's never <laughs> enough time. Yes. Uh, but so here's, a, here's a very, another probing question. Do you feel the types of people running for president are different from those who run for lower political office? Well, that's an interesting it question. An interesting I mean, question. I have to say most people who are running for president probably ran for a lower office to get there. Not all of them. This year you're seeing a whole group of people who have never run for office. And I think those people who are less tested in the public eye, you know, you'd have to really be careful about that because you don't, the public doesn't know them as well. It's a very, it's a very difficult job to be in the public eye. I can tell you that from experience. Uh, because everything you do is scrutinized and open to public scrutiny, and that's what you buy into when you run for public office. I think, uh, just as a side note, it's one of the reasons that you don't see as many women running for public office. I think women don't kind of like that idea as much. Yeah, I think this year is proving a different kind of presidential year. You are seeing more and more people who have never run for public office. Uh, running for president, and I think it'll be interesting to watch to see if the public really can develop enough of a feel and a trust for these people that they'd be willing to have them as a president. So we've got another, what, 18 months or something of mm. that, that, that's yeah. going to be filling at the airwaves. So. so one of the questions that's come up is, what, you know, what would you do to get more people to vote? There was someone else who said, you know, 10 years ago we worked on a grant that was to help America Vote Act. And we, the idea was it would work at Middlesex Community College to encourage voter registration. Mm -hmm. So this is a perennial challenge. 
And then what, what's on the top of your list to try to influence people to exercise the right to vote? I honestly think once someone takes that first step of registering to vote, it's a very important moment. I think what I would do is do more civic education at a younger age. I think more and more we're not teaching much about government and civics anymore, particularly in elementary school. You know, we used to tell little stories about the leaders of the country and all that. That's kind of getting squeezed out by a lot of the testing that's going on. I have to be somebody who thinks we do way too much testing of basics and, and rather not a teaching about what it means to be a citizen of the country, how to participate in public life, how to help other people, how to be involved in things. So I, I think that if I had one thing I would suggest, I'd say more civic education at a younger age. So let me jump from that one to um, whether, in, this is a historical question, can you think of a specific reason or point in time where the voting rates diminished and why do you think uh, this mm. happened? What caused the downfall? Yeah, this may be myth. I don't know. It's my own sense of things. But it was really after Watergate when people got very discouraged about what they saw as the corruption at the highest levels of government. And I think people started tuning out. And also, I think the advent of so much media uh, attention where people feel that it's all so um, contrived, that these are no longer real people, that everybody's like spinning something. And I can, I definitely remember, it was like in the 1970s when the whole Watergate thing happened. And then you, the first court decision that supported the idea that you could spend a lot of money to get elected. And that changed a lot because the, I think you can't discount the role of money in politics. It is huge money and it more and more it is influencing people who get elected. So one question that is perennial might be, what can you do about that? Which is part of this is you can register to vote, to voice your concerns based on the whatever politics are being represented by the candidates. Uh, one question here, though, and this is a little bit like that, is what percent of our votes actually count toward the presidential election? So this is like, how do, you, how do your mm -hmm. votes count? And maybe this is act asking about the Electoral College, too. Yes, yeah. There is a move in the country to go back to a sort of one man, one vote uh, in the sense that you'd have a basically whoever gets the most vote wins, <laughs> which is not how it is right now, because whoever gets the most popular vote doesn't necessarily win, because you also have to have the electoral votes, which has meant that we focus, everybody focuses on maybe five states now, and it's getting to be even smaller because of the Electoral College. And it's too complicated to go into why that's true, but there is a move among states to kind of join a consortium. There's about 16 states now that are saying, okay, if we will commit that if this person, whoever it is, gets the most popular votes, we will commit our state's electoral votes to that person. And what that will mean, if, if enough states do that, it will mean that literally the person with the most votes wins. Um, and I would support that, frankly. I think that that's one of the reasons that people have felt disenfranchised to some extent, because the vote only seems to count in places like Ohio and uh, Illinois and maybe Florida to some extent. So uh, that, I think, is one of the reasons that, that it's been a problem. So, so thank you. So uh, let me ask another question, which is, it's a legacy question, um, and then there are a variety of questions that go with this. What's the hardest part of your job? Um, how, what do you think is different about Connecticut because of the work you've been doing? And then, you know, what, what would you like to have your legacy be? Or what kind of a legacy have you been building? So mm. this is a, a career yeah. question for you. Yeah, I'll take the last one first. Um, I think my legacy will be I'm trying to make it easier to vote. I think we ought to do everything we can to empower voters, to make them feel part of the process, to make them think this is not going to be a hassle. Now, that might sound kind of pedestrian, if you will, but truthfully, I think you know it shouldn't be a hassle. It should, everybody should be allowed to vote, you know, in the easiest way possible, and we should be doing everything we can to make people feel you own the system, not us. And so I hope that will be my legacy. We passed a number of laws to make things better, like online voter registration, like election day registration. You know, there have been, imp I think these are impediments to voting that have grown up over the years. And uh, I'd like to see Connecticut be in the forefront. I think the next thing I'd like to do is what they call automatic voter registration, just passed in Oregon. 
and it would mean basically if you were, uh, you know, you're automatically a voter uh, when you turn 18 and you're a citizen. And if you want to opt out, you could opt out. But this would reduce all the bureaucracy that we have, that has grown up around voter registration. So that's my legacy, I think. I, I mean, why do we have to register to vote? I mean, that, now that seems so rational. <laughs> you're an American citizen, you're 18. You should be able to vote. You should be able to vote. That's right. Right. Yeah. Well, um, let, well, good luck. I hope that you can do that one. Thank Within you. my lifetime. That's what I always say. Within my <laughs> lifetime, I want to see that. Uh, somebody asked, what's the hardest part of your job? The hardest part of my job? Wow. I don't know. I really love my job, honestly. I guess it's, it's kind of constantly being asked to uh, defend myself against various, you know, people are always trying to claim that I'm in somebody's side or another side because as Secretary of the State, I have to sort of oversee all the elections. And, and it's very difficult always to be scrutinized for every single decision my office makes, not even just me. So sometimes that's hard. I've never really been um, attacked publicly for anything, even in my long career, until I became Secretary of State. And then you get in an election, and sometimes, you know, the person running against you starts saying nasty, negative, sometimes not true things about you. And so that's been difficult. I have to say, you have to have a very thick skin. You have to be able to say, oh, look, it doesn't really matter. Nobody's going to believe that. But you know, that's hard to believe sometimes. I think it's important for elected officials to help, help new people who are thinking about running for election, develop that thick skin, understand how to keep your bearing. Because yeah. it, isn't, it isn't easy. And it's, it, because of social media, it's gotten harder. Well, my timekeeper is telling me that the time is up, which is always really a sad moment for me. I want to thank Secretary Merrill for being with us today. But I also want to thank all of you for these really great questions yes. and for staying very quiet. You were very, very quiet today. But why don't we just applaud, and then we'll close the show with that.